Friends, we are so glad to have you here with us today. Um, the The words that I've been meditating on this week have been that God is still on the throne, and that is a good thing. Um, So I am so pumped to be here with y'all today. We are going to have a great morning. Um, Today marks the second Sunday of Lent, which is a season of preparation and repentance in which we anticipate Good Friday and Easter, which is coming. Um, And just like we carefully prepare for big moments in our personal lives, like weddings and graduations, um, the season of Lent invites us to ready our hearts for remembering Jesus' passion and celebrating his resurrection So right now, as we ready our hearts for worship, let us spend a couple moments in prayer. I'd ask that you would ask the Lord to renew and revive your heart for Jesus. Ask Jesus to fan the flame in your heart with a deeper love for Jesus. So let's go to Jesus in prayer. God, you are good. You are faithful to your people. And God, even when we cannot see it, you are working all things together for our good and for your glory. God, we love you. We are so grateful to be here with you. God, renew our hearts. Bring up in us a new spirit. God, make it new. You can do it. Um, God, fan the flame of our heart. Give us a deeper love for you. God, you can do all things. Make us new, Lord. We love you so much. Amen. Will you join me this morning in reading aloud our call to worship? Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water. And you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my steadfast, sure love for David. Now let us go to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, as we sing. Would you stand with us as we sing? And just as a posture this morning, would you open your hands? Open your hearts to all that God has for us this morning. We come, Lord, expectant to see you, to experience you, Lord, to know you. We come to love you, God, to remember your faithfulness through the ages, God. You are so faithful. You are so good. Would you be our strength? Would you be our shield this morning? Would you come, Holy Spirit, revive our hearts? We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you. Okay. 
looking at the curse Blessed Redeemer You have set this cat to free Oh Lord, I can never see Oh, He's faithful, faithful You are, yes, you are, Lord desperate for you, Lord. We want your presence. We long for you. Our hearts ache for more of you. Come, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare, you're our living hope. Yes, Your presence, Lord. Taste it and see. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone. Where is that? Your presence, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Sing, Holy 
Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come fly this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, oh, we've tasted. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Hallelujah. In your presence, Lord. We see you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. We welcome you. Come fly this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. Oh 
He's so good, so loving. So every week we come with set aside time just to reflect on his goodness, to reflect on his faithfulness, and to allow his kindness to draw us to a place of repentance. And so we are a forgetful people. We forget um, basic things every single week. And yet uh, we often forget too just the greatness of our God and our need for a Savior. And so to realign our telos, the true north, of who Jesus is to us and to remember our place in God's eternal family. We come to recount these truths, to confess our sin, to remember that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. There's nothing that we can do to earn more of his love. There's nothing we can do to outrun his love. That it is all encompassing, never ending, never giving up. So that's why we sing that's why we recount these truths every single week. I invite you now just to pray with me as you read this as a corporate prayer of confession. Let's read this together. Lord, we have denied you by refusing to know you. We have betrayed you by keeping our distance. We have mocked you by pretending we are not yours. Lord, we are lost. Let your forgiveness find us. Welcome us into your strong, forgiving arms. And let us feel reconciled again. Amen. Would you spend just a moment just in private confession of the Lord? Would you think back on this last week and just take to him everything that it may be a burden to you? Your sin, your shortcoming, your failure. Just lay it at his feet this morning. This time each week is not meant to shame sinners, but rather for the children of God to ret return to their true and loving fathers. This is our assurance. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We belong to him. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now, you are, and you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That is the truth of the gospel, our loving God. Thanks be to God. Let's sing this together. Hallelujah for the cross. There's a song, too, we used to sing in Sunday school. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Yeah. We like to clap. If you don't, or don't like to clap, it's fine. But man, if I'm happy and I know it, I do clap my hands. <laughs> there might be some clapping in this song. Without your goodness, I would be desperate. Without your love, sleep to the darkness. If it was in for the cross, oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And you have 
Just heap that shame and that guilt on us. We sing this next verse. All my shame was met with his mercy. Hallelujah. Let's sing this. Come on. All my shame was met with mercy. And now your mercy will be my song.
Our reading comes from Job chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Timonite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job, and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer, not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters, and all who had known him before, and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy, and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them he gave him, and each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning, Vintage Church Durham. It's good to be worshiping the Lord with you today. Uh, if you're new to Vintage or if you haven't been a part of Vintage Church for a while, um, you've probably still heard this week in and week out. Uh, Vintage Church is a place for doubters and seekers and followers of Jesus to learn to worship Jesus together. What I love about that truth is that uh, we don't say vintage is a place where sinners and saints can come together and learn how to be saints together, right? Because we recognize that no matter where you are in this journey, right, there's something that God is doing in you. The gospel is this invitation to see that work of God. And so week in and week out, we preach Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I'm really excited this week because as you can tell by the reading, like we don't have to like start in the dumps and like, we'll get there, don't worry. Like it's Job, we're gonna be true to the the whole narrative, right? But but we get to to come in with joy. And uh, you know, I hadn't, considered this through the week, but then when Crystal was reading to us, I heard this and I thought about the privilege that I have to share the word of God with you because week in and week out, I feel like Job uttering what he didn't understand uh, and things that are too wonderful for me. Like I get to tell you things that are beyond me and too wonderful even for words, and, and I get to wrestle with words to, 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 to just proclaim how good Jesus is, how worthy of trust and how worthy of our lives and how worthy of following him Jesus is, and that's what we do. Uh, but I do that as a broken, sinful person. Uh, when we come to the time of compa- confession, like I'm right there with us, confessing in need of Jesus. Uh, And I say that because we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And, you know, we don't do that each week to sort of transition into the teaching time. We do that because I'm a man of unclean lips and ears, and we're a people of unclean ears, and we need the Holy Spirit. Right? So when I pray, you pray with me earnestly. If you're a doubter, if you're a seeker, I'm going to ask you to do something strange, too, and to pray as well. Right? Invite the Spirit of God to speak through the Word of God to you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're here at the end of Job, and there is oh so much. And truth be told, we could spend months just in Job 42, but we're going to fly through it in, in just a matter of minutes. And so God, by the power of your Spirit, would you reveal, would you speak, would you move, Each soul in here is walking through something that only they and you know. So you have to speak. And we're inviting you to do that. Speak through this broken, sinful, earthly vessel. And change us by the power of your spirit. Amen. So we've come to the end of Job. The truth is, we're in week eight of walking wounded, we're finishing Job, but all of life is learning to walk wounded. Uh, Even when you're in places where you feel strong and where you feel like, I don't need to limp anymore, in fact, I feel a good sprint coming on, all of life is remembering that you can sprint for a while, but you're gonna run into something and it's gonna beat you down for a little bit. It's gonna beat you down. And you're gonna have to walk again, dependent, as always, on God. And this is Job's story. Job was moving at a good pace, wasn't he? Job's life was good. By every discernible metric of his day, of the ancient Near East, he had sons to carry on his inheritance. He had land, he had possessions, he had animals, he had servants, he had daughters, he had a wife, he had all things that were good, all things that were good for people in that day. Is that better? All right, well, y'all can hear me. I'm loud enough for the room, so 
live stream, register next week. No, <laughs> do, what, do what's comfortable. We understand this time, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, Job had everything that he needed, that he could want, that a man could desire in his day, and everyone even saw the righteousness of Job. And still, Job went from a sprint to a sudden, sudden stop. I think about the uh, not so culturally accurate, but still, and I say this as a child of Jamaican immigrants, right? Like, but still just wonderful movie, Cool Runnings, right? Um, right? Is, is it history? Ah, is it culturally accurate? Ah, is it a great movie? Absolutely. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but... I think about that opening scene where they've all been prepared to run this race to get to the Olympics. Uh, for Doris, the future is just bright. Everything is ahead of him. He was born of Olympic stock. He has worked his tail off. He is going to get there. And he's running and he's sprinting and there are others with him, right? And, and they're running and they have won this race. They are nearing the finish line. Man, it's good. That's a wrap. Like, people are putting their names on tickets for a flight to, to, to the Olympics. And then one person stumbles, then they trip, and in an instant, they go from sprinting to flat on their faces, and sometimes life does that to us. And that's what happens here to Job. One second, one moment, he has everything, and then the next four moments, he finds he doesn't have livestock, he finds he doesn't have servants, he finds his sons and their wives and their families are dead, he finds that his children now all have died. Another moment, he finds that his body is now covered with boils and he can barely move. Job goes from sprinting to flat on his face and he looks around and how could this happen? And The whole book is wrestling with how could this happen? And he wrestles with his friends. They say, the world works where good people get good things and bad things happen to bad people. What did you do wrong, Job? And Job, he, he, he demands that he is innocent. And he's right. Job is innocent. And it can't explain his pain and his suffering. And then God himself comes and speaks to Job. And God shows Job the vast picture of the universe. You remember this from the last two weeks. And what, Job, what God says to Job is, is your life, a child around Christmas, we'll say a cross child or a member of the cross family because I don't know, like one of our Christmas traditions is puzzles. We like puzzles and they've gone from like, you know, 100 piece puzzles that the kids could all do to like a couple, several thousand people piece puzzles, right? And, and what Job is doing is looking at the piece of the grand narrative of God's redemptive work in the cosmos that is his puzzle piece. And he is attempting to derive from that one piece. Imagine not having the box, not having any sort of guide, looking at that piece and assuming that the entire puzzle is that thing. No, it's just one piece of the puzzle and for a moment just a brief moment God takes him and allows him to step back and to see the entire puzzle that God is putting together the beauty the wonder the danger the mystery the redemption the joy the tears he sees the whole puzzle and we come to Job 42 and in seeing that whole puzzle he recognizes he says I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted who is this that hides counsel without knowledge therefore I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me which I did not know hear and I will speak I will question you and you will make it known to me I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear but now my eyes see you therefore I repent 
Job gets a glimpse of the cosmic greatness, the infinite glory, the power, the majesty, the wisdom, the sovereignty of God. He gets a glimpse and all of a sudden he realizes something, that for a long time he had been living his life hearing of God, but not actually seeing God as God is. And when he goes from hearing to seeing, everything changes. When he goes from hearing about, little pieces of information about, scripture passages and practices that point to a thing, when he went from those types of things, the signpost that says New York City, 100 miles, when he goes from seeing the road signs that point to and speak about God, right? You've all been there. I don't know if you've been to New York City. My wife's from Northern Jersey, so she just calls it the city, right? Like, and she, when you're going there, you see the signs, you see the signs, but the signs cannot prepare you for the majesty that you see and feel when you see that skyline coming into view. Right, and you get excited, and it's like, ooh, there's that, and there's that. All of these buildings that I recognize, and then you go in the tunnel, perhaps. Some of you may take a break, whatever. You go in the Lincoln Tunnel, right, like Buddy. And, and you come out, and you see just wonder. How did people do this? And that city is nothing, nothing compared to the majesty Kilimanjaro, the Himalayas, the Grand Canyon, the ocean depths of which we know very, very little about, let alone space and all that comes past it, the wonder of what God has made. And Job goes from seeing signs and hearing about to seeing God. And he's changed. And in all of this, Job now begins to see, understand, and believe. And so for that, God forgives and restores. You see, that's what comes next. The Lord has spoken these words to Job, or after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord then turns to Eliphaz, the Temanite, and he says, my anger burns against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job did. So now God is acknowledging that in all of this, in all of this mess, in all that Job gets wrong, he ultimately gets it right. I think that's remarkable, that there is a way in which our posture can be theologically accurate, but get it wrong. And there's a way that our posture can be theologically just off, be shaped by the Lord, have a posture of humility, and can have spoken truly about who God is. I mean, that's remarkable. Job had got so much wrong, and yet God says, ultimately, in the end, he bowed down to glory and said, do and be who you are. And he gets it right. And then he says, now therefore go take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves and my servant Job will pray for you. So now we get this interesting story and this interesting turn of events where Job's friends had come to Job because Job was the one in need. Job was the one who was weak. Job was the one who was suffering. But the faithfulness of Job in suffering became stronger than the strength and the wisdom of the friends who were, uh, who were whole, who hadn't lost because his suffering had led him to the feet of God. And now the ones who hadn't lost anything are in need from the one who had lost everything. This is one of those divine reversals that you just see all the time in scripture that is so remarkable. The one who is weak is the source of strength for the one who thought they were strong. And here in Job's life and in this story, Job now has to pray for the friends. God says, I'll hear Job's prayer and I'll forgive you. And so Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite, all of these names, y'all. <laughs> they all receive the blessing of God because of the broken servant of God, Job. 
And not only that, God restores all of Job's fortune. He gives Job more than what he had before. More land, more sheep, more livestock, sons and daughters. He brings restoration. This is the story of Job. But this is the story of what God is doing in all the cosmos. This is the gospel. Love it. Job, written thousands of years, told, transmitted orally, thousands of years before Jesus, gives us foretaste. This is wisdom literature, and it gives us the wisdom of the gospel work, the redemptive work of God. We've gone through Job's story. Now we're going to go backwards and look at the story of the universe. We're going to start in the end because that's where we leave off. Job has had everything restored. Right, Job has received all of these things. It says, And the Lord blessed Job's latter days more than the beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the daughters Jemima, Keziah, Karen, Hapuk. And in the land that they were, there were no women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And then Job lives a long and happy life. Listen, this ends with a feast and rejoicing, and Job getting sons and daughters. Now, if we're looking at Job as a person, as as a human, and we think about our lives, uh, there is no amount of, of blessing that could replace the loss that Job has received. And so in some sense, we have to understand that, yeah, seven new sons and three new daughters can't replace the old sons and daughters that Job had, that the ones that Job lost. You see, and even in Job's story, what we get is this replacing. But the gospel is even better than that, right? Here, Job gets all new things. But Revelation 21, Jesus tells us that he is making all things new. Jesus is taking what is broken and dead, dying, and, 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 and he's, he's bringing life. He's resurrecting. He's making whole. He's renewing. This isn't consolation prize and new things. This is Jesus making right all that was wrong, the brokenness that you've experienced. The hurt and the pain of the world does not have the final word. No, God's redemptive love does. And this is what Jesus is bringing. And I love it because it's even better than before. It's even better here than before with Job in ways you might not have recognized. Because the first thing you think about is the sheer number of things that Job gets back and of children that Job gets back. But listen to this mysterious phrase. Think of it through the lens of an ancient Near Eastern, not a contemporary Westerner. And in the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father Job gave them, who? The daughters. And their father Job gave them, the daughters, an inheritance among their brothers. That is unheard of. And in Job's joy of having been restored to God and having had all of these blessings come, Job sees a new way of doing things wherein it is not just sons as those who will continue the family legacy and business and and daughters as those who are vessels to be given to expand the empire, but rather sons and daughters as equal heirs. That is unheard of in the ancient Near East. And it makes my mind go to Joel 2, 
where it says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your sons and your daughters will be equal beneficiaries of the inheritance of the spirit of God. This is what God is doing. He is expanding restoration. He is expanding inheritance. He is expanding the promise to all people through his son, Jesus. And so there's this remarkable story of restoration, and we get to look forward to it. The arc of the universe is bending to the glory and the shalom of God. That's justice. That's restoration. That is, that is uh, all image bearers carrying and, and holding that dignity that is inherent in being a human being bearing the image of God. Like, this is a remarkable story of transformation. And this is what we have to look forward to. And this is what you're invited to. And here's how God does it. Because we're gonna zip back a second in Job's story. And I love this because this is a remarkable thing as well. It says, go to Job, bring your sacrifices to Job, and my servant Job shall pray for you. And I will accept his prayer. I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. Job, the suffering servant, now right with God, prays on behalf of his knucklehead friends who got nothing right and even caused him grief upon grief so that they might be redeemed. Y'all, I'm not making this up. Like, Scripture is just this easy sometimes, right? That's, Jesus is our great and glorious Job. He had all things from the beginning. He was perfectly satisfied, righteous, and blameless before God. And yet, he saw fit, unlike Job who didn't see it coming, Jesus saw fit to choose to lose all of it. Jesus saw fit to suffer, to feel abandonment, to feel, right, like we don't get, we don't really, I think, dive deep into with our modern understanding of what's happening in the, the garden before Jesus goes to the cross. But it's, he's sweating blood, he can't sleep, he just wants someone to be present with him. There is anxiety rising in him. If, if we were to describe that, you might say J Jesus had a panic attack. Jesus is so profoundly human and he so profoundly understands the weight of suffering that he will endure. And he goes to his father and he says, your will be done, not mine. Jesus said, take this from me. Jesus comes with that Job honesty. What are you doing here? If you would, take this cup from me. I don't want to drink it. But your will be done and not mine. Jesus the one who had it all, who gives it all away, who loses it all, and who suffers. God sees him. God hears him. God honors him. God raises him from the dead. And now he is seated at the right hand of God, doing what? Interceding, praying, literally, on behalf of those who added to his pain. Jesus is our great, perfect, glorious Job. Jesus actually saw the whole redemptive story. He saw what it would cost him, and he walked into it. And in this moment, that future, that glory, we get it because Jesus gets it. This feast that's for Job ultimately is the feast for Jesus. This renewal, all these sons and daughters, those who will bear his name, those who will receive his inheritance, Jesus gets that. Everyone who gets it gets it by being a part of Jesus, by being in Jesus, or in Job, sorry, in the story, by being a child of Job, by being inherited by being interceded for by, by the priestly in that moment action of Job bringing them in. Likewise, Jesus inherits all that the Father has. Everything good. And you and I are invited to be heirs, co-heirs together. Men, women, messed up theology, somehow got most of it right all the time. I think about like the good place. Like actually, he got like 86%. We don't know how he did it, right? Like all of these things, all of us are invited together and, and Jesus intercedes on our behalf. We come with all of the raggedy gifts that we have, bringing everything we have 
repentant, acknowledging we're wrong. We say, here, Jesus, take this. God, take this. And Jesus turns to the Father and says, they're with me. Accept it. And, Job ex- and God accepts Job's friends because of Job's prayer, and even more so, you. You have been accepted, forgiven, redeemed, adopted by God because of the prayer and the faithful work of King Jesus. Job gives us the gospel because the redemptive work of God has been the same from the beginning. I will redeem for myself a people and I will do it through my suffering servant. So how do we get that? How is it that we're found in Jesus? Well, let's go back just a little bit further because this is the invitation. And listen, some of you are what. I'm getting ahead of myself because this is just, y'all, come on, listen. Verse five, I had heard of you, but now I have seen you. I had heard of you, but now I have seen you. In John chapter one, this is where we're gonna end. Uh, You wouldn't think Job to John, but here we are. In John chapter one, Jesus is going out. And, And he goes, and as he's walking, he calls his first disciples, right? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, all of these folks, and and. And he brought them, and and Jesus looked at him, verse 42, he said, you are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, so Jesus comes. Then the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. And this is John chapter one, verse 43, if you wanna follow along. And, And now verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. We found the one we've been looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Did you hear that invitation? Come and see. Listen, so often when you come to church or when we invite people into this thing that we're talking about, like this faith, the way, we often say, come and reason. Come and listen. Come and see. What is it that Nathaniel sees? As Jesus is approaching, coming towards him, he says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. uh, Philip comes and speaks to Nathanael. Nathaniel says, I don't really believe this. Philip doesn't say, hey, let's reason this out a little bit. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The prophets said the Messiah would be of Bethlehem, right? That's one for me. Let's keep going, you know? Like, that's not what happens. He just says, come and see. And upon seeing Jesus, this is what Nathaniel finds. That Jesus saw Nathaniel in a moment so personal that there's no way anyone but the king of Israel, the Messiah, the son of God, could have known it. He said, I saw you before Philip called you when you were under the tree. I don't know what was going on in Nathaniel under the tree. I don't know what that meant. But two people did, Jesus and Nathaniel. And when you come and see Jesus, what you come to see is that Jesus has already seen you. 
in your darkest moments, in your most alone places, and he still invites you in. I saw you under the tree. You are the son of God, the king of Israel. And Jesus says, but wait, there's more. Because you think that's something? Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. You believe? You'll see greater things than these. And I said to, and he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. I wish I had like three years to dive into how cool it is that Jesus references Jacob's ladder and the angels ascending and descending on his ladder to heaven and Jesus saying I'm that ladder I have come down to bring you home that's what you see when you see Jesus a loving compassionate savior and we know that Job spirit had heard about Jesus friends come and see see and watch as the spirit of God through the Son of God, brings your heart in line with the will and the purposes of God. Let's pray. God, I do pray that we would be a people who would say, I had heard of you with my ears. I had reasoned. I had discerned. I had studied. But now, Now I see you, and I'm dust. And as we come to you as dust, would you renew us? This is the only way to walk through life. We walk wounded because we follow the one who walked wounded through death and into life forever. Amen. The end of all of this is a feast. A table prepared by the very Son of God for us. And while we wait, Jesus has given us an ordinance, communion. You see, because on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread with his friends and he broke it. And breaking it, he said, this is my body. And in the same way, he took the cup. And as he poured it, he said, this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant, of a new way, a new life. And every time we gather together, we are commanded by Jesus to eat and drink in remembrance of him and in remembrance of what is to come. And it's one of the ways as a church that we respond to the gospel. So if you are a follower, and if your hope is in that day through the risen sun, this meal is yours. And I would invite you now to take it. Take that bread and that wine. And remember Jesus. Another way that we respond to the gospel is through prayer. When you see that we are but a puzzle piece in this infinite puzzle that God himself is orchestrating and putting together, you realize how desperately in need of him you are and that response is prayer. We're a family, we pray for each other. So if you need prayer, let us know. You can do that on our prayer wall, you can fill out a card, you can just email us. We want to be praying for you, and we invite and ask you to pray for one another. Brothers and sisters, our family members are hurting. And we need to be lifting each other to the throne of grace in prayer. We also respond through generosity. We give because God has given us so much in Christ Jesus. If you'd like to give to the mission of Vintage Church, 
And Vintage Church is one church that meets in four congregations in Durham. We contextualize into this part of the triangle, into this city, into Durham. And if you want to give to that, you can. There's a box in the back you can give online. You can text 77977 uh, and text Vintage to that and get instructions. Lastly, lastly, we respond in worship. One day our hearts are going to see the fullness of what Jesus has done for us, and the only response that will make any sense to us is to spend the rest of eternity worshiping him. And we get to do that even just a little bit now. So, so let's stand, let's posture our hearts towards the heaven, towards the one who redeemed, is redeeming, and will ultimately redeem and renew all things. Jesus Christ. Let's worship. I love when the Holy Spirit just interrupts your plan. And... Uh, we're going to sing something different than what we had planned. We're just going to sing Hallelujah for the Cross again. Um, hearing that truth of Job being um, a picture of Christ, Jesus being the greater Job, just uh, stirred my heart in a way that I just feel like we got to sit in this a little longer. We're like a band that sings one song. We just keep playing it over and over until we see him. Right? This is our inheritance our future eternal that we get to worship king jesus together so let's just sing this together
Freedom, there's nothing like it. Freedom in Jesus, we're free from approval of man, free of fear. We're free of worrying about what's next that he gave us today. And we get to sing about that today. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. Never been so free, caught in your love for me. Never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. Never been so free, caught in your love. Down deep in my soul. Just praise Him this morning. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for your joy that you give us. There's hope, there's a bright future for us, Lord, in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. have a redeemer who lives. Amen. Amen. Hurt and pain do not have the final word. The love of God has the final word over today and over your life. We get to say like Job in verse two, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Yes, it was a good Sunday for a little victory. Um, I know that's true for me. We are so thankful that you are here. People of God, let us claim the freedom of Christ. That Let us claim the freedom that Christ gives us by his sacrifice on the cross. May he enable us to serve Durham together in faith, hope, and love. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, body, and soul be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Hey guys, if you're in service with us here, um, we are going to ask that you would just hang in your seats and an usher will come and let you out. Thank you for being normal about the fact that we're live streaming. Um, So go ahead and take a seat and someone will come and let you out. And then we would just ask that um, we would love for you to hang out and get to know people here in church. But if you could do it outside, it's going to be 70 today. So my buffalo heart is feeling good. Um, So you could just head outside and hang out out there. That would be great.